The wide world of anime is a terrifying place. You never know what you're gonna get. I guess maybe in that sense, it's more like a box of chocolate, but I am far more agoraphobic than Mr. Gump. See, outside of the comfy, cozy, seasonal blocks most of my colleagues profit from substantially lies a world of truly bizarre sh left in the dark, and that's where you're gonna find me. Now over in the Patreon, we like to do weekly movie nights, and since it's my Patreon, I like to do it my way, which means finding the weirdest sounding films and OVAs and making myself and our patrons go in totally blind. And while there has been a couple duds, the vast majority of unearthed VHS conversions have been a great way to truly trauma bond our community. One day, we're gonna cover Dark Cat on the channel here, guys. One day. Dark Cats unite! But today is not that day. Today, we cracked the dusty movie gallery plastic box containing a film I should have known about, but somehow missed until this year. A Wind Named Amnesia is a terrible name for anything. It's not particularly evocative, and when Tyler put it on the schedule, I was particularly unenthused going in. Dumb name, bad box art, but what I found within was one of the most unrealized ambitions I had ever seen. A Wind Named Amnesia is a crazy post-apocalyptic nightmare. It is all over the place with its plot, atmosphere, and message, which I'm still not sure of. But one thing is certain, it was awesome. My kind of awesome. Hellmouth awesome. Of course, there's hyperviolence and existential terror that makes it perfect for the season, but it is also completely ridiculous. Meaning, while it was what most people would call bad, I saw brilliance that simply didn't have space to bloom. However, the snapshots of brilliance in action was enough to leave a lasting impression, and one that made me feel like I had to spotlight the film in a video. So here we are. But what truly blew my mind was after the watch party when I looked into the production's background and found its origins. A Wind Named Amnesia is a madhouse film based off of a book by none other than Hideyuki Kikuchi, the man who brought us Demon City Shinjuku, Wicked City, and of course, the entirety of Vampire Hunter D, all of which we have covered on this channel. I then instantly looked into the credits and found the exact name I was looking for, Yoshiaki Kawajiri. Though, not in the place I was expecting to find it. Instead of directing, Kawajiri-san would instead be a script writer and supervisor on this project. And as viewers of this channel know, Kikuchi-san and Kawajiri generally go hand in hand when anime is involved. And that also means Madhouse is usually in the mix. Suddenly, everything became clear. Far more clear than I made the substance of this film so far. It all made sense why this absolutely nutso movie about the end of humanity had the feeling of a warm nostalgic blanket. So, if you are interested in a truly wild ride, then I suppose it's time. This is a wind named Amnesia. Let's get into it. God, that was a really terrible name. <laughs> This year is all about the Patreon, guys. Patreon, Patreon, Patreon. That's what we're doing. It is the best community on the web. And that's just not, that's like, that's not hyperbole, guys. Come on. This has been reaffirmed multiple times by multiple people. I mean, people jump into the scene and they're immediately like, wow, I didn't expect this to be this good. It's $3 to get in and you get loaded up on benefits right away from that. You would literally have to watch 700 episodes or more of Bonsai Pop in order to make $3 worth of revenue. Seriously, YouTube is weird. We're trying to make enough money to hire editors so that we can make you guys more content. If that sounds like something you want, I recommend checking it out. Thank you so much for your time on the show. So if you thought the title A Wind Named Amnesia was some Japanese esoteric poeticism at work, I hate to shatter your illusions, it's literal. This isn't Clamp, my dudes, it's Kikuchi-san, and he's not exactly known for subtlety. So get this, the premise of the film is that one day in 1990X, a wind blew across the world and every human being completely lost their memories. But not in a, oh who am I, where am I kind of way, nah, they lost everything, language, culture, socialization, history, essentially every person on the planet became totally feral with no social connections instantaneously. And that's pretty awesome. Like, what a fascinating concept I've never seen explored. The chaos, the destruction, I mean nobody even understands how to feed themselves. Canned food would be totally useless. How are you gonna open a can? You don't know how to use a can opener. These are people who don't even know how to make fire, or even that fire burns, and it all happens 
in an instant. Now, I remember the real 1990X when everyone was freaking out about Y2K and talking about how planes were going to simply drop from the sky, but in this scenario, that's exactly what would happen. Actually, it does happen. But also, like, nuclear power plants would go unmanned and overload, with thousand car pileups would block the highways, construction workers would fall off of scaffolding and crush people below, Mark Zuckerberg would fall from his hover surfboard and drown. I mean, your imagination can really run wild with this concept from the macro to the micro. It's some Something that could easily turn into a full-on series. It could be huge. It's zombies without the zombies. The true danger of the human species unplugged and unleashed. But if that's the case, then why does a wind named Amnesia live in relative obscurity? Well, I haven't read the source material yet, but judging from the film alone, it didn't decide to focus on just the really, really cool setup I just described. Instead, it, uh, well, you'll see. Now, while my previous statement is emphatically true, we do get some excellent day one shots of the chaos when everybody loses their memories. Like, there's this plane that hits this building. That's some good shot. Vehicles exploding, people fighting like feral dogs. There's this one really good shot, this guy punching a little kid. Like, that's how you know an anime is gonna be good. I call it the kid dies box. You check that box, you're in for a guaranteed ride. There's also a pretty poignant shot of the main character eating a flower, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, flowers, they look pretty tasty, right? If you didn't know better, you'd probably try and eat one despite a lot of them being super poisonous. I can't even imagine what not understanding the feeling of like thirst would be like, right? Or imagine taking your first dump. That'd blow your mind, dude. Anyway, we get to see MC steal some food from some kids, which is particularly funny. Then he tries to fight his own reflection, adding to the humor. And after running away like a dumb dog, he finds himself in an old government institution where he witnesses some handy capable kid fighting a dude in his tidy whiteies with telekinesis. This movie is batch. See, all of this so far is being narrated by the gentleman who grabbed the little kid's wieners, Wataru, and the way we meet him is just as ridiculous as Telekinetic Man here. The film opens up with a real escape from LA vibe as a dude in a jeep wearing a Ryu headband drives across a post-apocalyptic looking bridge. That's Wataru, and the film actually takes place in America, which is relatively rare. Cannot wait to see them do this fine nation justice. But. This is also anime, so of course, there's a motherfucking mech dog. You thought this movie was just about people losing their memories and turning into terrifying monkey people? Nah, that's just the hook. The movie is really about... What the hell is this movie actually about? Anyway, this Japanified Terminator is an anti-riot mech on autopilot, and in its defense, I mean, people are definitely breaking the law. The reason I know that this is a Japanese production, though, is because the Coppot is killing white people. They don't understand our society very well. For some reason, though, Coppot has it bad for Wataru. Probably noticed he's Asian and assumed he was from Wuhan, responsible for creating the amnesia wind in a lab or something. I don't know, I'll risk monetization for that joke. So after receiving a telepathic message telling him to shoot directly into the mech's gun barrel, Wataru meets the other MC, Sophia, a mysterious hot chick who knows how to talk still and is sus as f Okay, back to the telekinetics. Wheelchair-bound Hanako Kun's real name is Johnny, and he was a part of a mysterious project conducted by the American government to unlock the potential of the human mind. And just so you know, the IRL CIA definitely didn't actually attempt this and fail miserably. That's sarcasm. They did. It was called MK Ultra, and I'm not fing with you. Regardless, Johnny plugs Dr. Manhattan in the dome, saving Wataru, who he takes in like a stray man cat. Using the tech left over from definitely not MK Ultra, Johnny is able to implant knowledge directly into Wataru's brain, slowly making him not a frothing maniac anymore. Unfortunately, though, the CIA and Minecraft are evil sociopaths, and Johnny doesn't have a ton of time left due to the experiments that were done on him. He endeavors to teach Wataru as much as he can before passing away. Rip Johnny, you are a good government lab rat. But before passing, he tells Wataru to go on an adventure to witness the pure nature of man, which is clearly violent chaos, but whatever. Then Wataru dons his cool Street Fighter headband and becomes protagonist Kuhn. Set up out of the way, the movie heads into its first of three sections. And like I said, this was an ambitious narrative. The execution is a little wonk, but man, does it pack an insane amount of crap for an hour and 15 minutes. Now, subversion of expectations is not what I would have expected from this movie. If you're watching this, you are probably highly aware that the Japanese content creators generally use a post-apocalyptic setting as an excuse to bring innocent women to Grape Town, if you know what I mean. It's also a Madhouse Kikuchi collab, and I, like, have you seen Wicked City? So, when a young woman is attacked in the street, I was like, here we go again, but no. 
she's saved and not a single booby is whipped out. It's actually kind of nice not to have to see sad Tiggles in every anime movie pre-2000. In fact, later, we get happy Tiggs when Sue, that's her name, innocently goes into the ocean. And I was like, man, this movie has like taste in its fan service. This movie? Okay. Turns out Sue and the guy that saved her are actually real father and daughter from before they lost their memories, and Sue is supposed to be sacrificed in this Mad Max style ritual. The people of the city have started worshipping this construction robot as a deity or something. I don't know, chaos ensues, Sue dies, Wataru gives a feral man a shotgun, Moving on, the movie then totally changes pace. This whole time, the cop bot is reconstructing itself every time Wataru blows it up and is totally fixated on the guy. It catches up with him and Sophia and blows them off a cliff, but sussy ass Sophia can apparently fly as well as speak telepathically. So then of course, Wataru wakes up in a facility and if you thought it was whack already, it is about to get way worse. So he and Sophia are now in a place called Future City that was created for some expo and is run by a supercomputer, right? He's treated by a nurse and a doctor, but things quickly get really weird. The people in the town look super similar, mostly because they're all the same two people acting out different roles. One is an older man and the other is a blonde younger woman. And at first you kind of assume they've just lost their minds because they're constantly switching personalities and professions. Uh, like one, the, at one point they're a doctor and then the woman starts acting uh, as the mayor. However, it turns out that all of this is being puppeteered by the main computer that's using the two people as avatars essentially, forcing them to live out a series of lives by implanting false memories in their brains. This of course, was after the computer killed the rest of the city's entire population or drove them out into the desert for being wild chimp people after they lost their memories. So after Sophia uses some kind of like magic mumbo jumbo to destroy the PC, Wataru convinces the young woman to leave with him. But on the way out, the girl starts remembering all the time that she spent with the old man in the city, including multiple relationships the main computer had put them in. You can't see me right now, but I'm doing that thing where, where you make like a circle with your, your thumb and your first finger, and then you use your first finger on your other hand and you go mm -mm 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 -mm. And in her final memory, she realizes that the old guy is actually her dad and runs back to him. But like, she banged her dad, dude. It's totally glossed over, but this, this chick, like, she totally banged her dad. Moving right along, not two minutes after that stunning revelation, Wataru and Sophia are on their own again, and Sophia decides it's time to reveal the big twist. One that makes M. Night Shyamalan look like he's a drooling idiot with zero self-awareness. It's more than a movie. Uh, that's what it should feel like. I don't know why, I can't put my finger on it, but it's more than a movie. Can you kind of expand on what role does race play um, in your cast? of these characters and more specifically um, why Caucasian actors are playing what in the original series were Inuit characters and why Middle Eastern or Central Asian characters are playing the, the, the Fire Nation. Anime. That is a joke using irony. It turns out Sophie is actually an alien whose people are responsible for the amnesia wind. The idea was to see if mankind was ready to join advanced aliens in space, but whatever race she belonged to wasn't sure if we were ready yet. So in a real big brain move, they decided to wipe out man's civilization in order to see what truly motivates our species. I, uh, I don't understand how this makes sense, but I guess, I don't know, you gotta break some eggs to make an omelet or some shit. I really don't even know anymore. Pepper? Salt? <laughs> Wataru is unfazed. So the two continue their journey across the country, constantly hounded by the cop bot, until they finally reach New York City. There, Wataru decides to finally go toe to toe with the mech in a final battle. And after a chase and like some shooties, he destroys it and he wakes up in a church, and Sophia totally just dumps them out. She then proceeds to reminisce over all of their fun adventures with Sacrificed Girl and Girl Who Banged Her Dad before Wataru takes her to Pound Town under a giant painting of Mary and that sweet, sweet baby Jesus. Then she goes back to space. The end. This movie is insane. I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty dumb, but it's highbrow stupid. You have this really 
excellent setup, right? This really unique catastrophe that has so many interesting implications and possibilities to explore. But f that, let's just anime it all up, right? We're gonna throw in some random future city with an existentially terrifying computer overlord. How about how about someone with telekinetic powers? Yeah, yeah, let's make him a government experiment. Oh, and the main girl is an alien. And the reason people lost their memories is because of aliens. Yeah, oh, and a mech, Let's get a mech in there, but the pilot died because when he lost his memories, his stupid dog brain couldn't figure out how to get out of the cockpit. Then we'll, uh, I don't know, we'll wrap it up somehow. Don't worry, just get to work. It's like spending a year on a really intricate tapestry and then just shitting on it for the final touch. I cannot tell you how many anime movies I've seen at this point, but it's enough to notice a trend of Japanese creators not knowing when to leave well enough alone. It's always got to go to the next level. And to be honest, that's kind of what I love about their productions. There have been viewing parties where we had every single one of us just walking away wondering what the hell we just saw. And it's always a fine line between, are they just throwing in everything that they possibly can think of, or is this chaotic genius? In, in the case of A Wind Named Amnesia, I'd have to go with the latter. Look, just because something is bad, doesn't mean it's bad. You know what I mean? This film was never going to win any awards, but it did check all my boxes. Weird plot, kid dies, hyperviolence, chick banger dad, unnecessary mech antagonist, aliens doing it under the gaze of Virgin Mary with said alien. Like, the fact that this exists and had money thrown at it and was produced by Madhouse is mind blowing. And this is generally the point in the video where I would analyze the deeper meanings of the film, but honestly, I am totally stumped. Even the very clear biblical imagery at the end means nothing to me. I cannot parse it. Sophia is not a Virgin Mary type figure. Hell, she isn't even a virgin, as you can clearly see, and Wataru isn't like Jesus. He isn't sacrificing anything for anyone's sins, and I highly doubt he's Jewish. He's also technically a violent murderer. Like I said, I'm stumped, and if there isn't anything behind this scene, then it's simply blasphemous, and that, my friends, is hilarious. I legitimately think that there is nothing more to a wind named Amnesia than what you get, which is an insane romp through a post-apocalyptic scenario that ends with zero resolution. And you know what? That's great. We don't get things like this much anymore. It's certainly a product of its time, but in my opinion, that's a damn shame. A Wind Named Amnesia is a perfect representation of unrestrained creativity. Maybe a little wonky, but it's art. And if we can pay 80 bucks to go to a fancy museum and see a 20 foot canvas that someone literally just threw paint on willy nilly and call it a masterpiece, then we should be able to fund more shit like this film. While anime finding a foothold in the West has been amazing for the bottom line of the industry and accessibility here, I think it's also taken away some of what made the medium truly unique and spectacular. Productions are now created with the West in mind, and let's be honest, the vast majority of Western casuals just want to see big jiggly anime tiggies, and that's fine. But since it's so economically fortuitous, it's oversaturating the market and keeping insane bullshit like this movie from being made in the present. And to be honest with you guys, I don't have a solution for this problem, and even if I did, my white American ass wouldn't be able to change much. So all I can really do is keep digging for gold in the annals of the past and presenting it to the people that love the same type of crap that I do. So here's a challenge. One up me on this film, and don't give me suggestions like Violence Jack, okay? I've seen that. Give me something real weird, something people haven't seen. I'd recommend checking out the video section on our channel to see what we've already covered before you just start throwing things at me. You may be surprised that we've hit a lot of weird stuff already. I am really looking forward to your comments. In the meantime, I recommend giving a win named Amnesia a watch or a rewatch. Bring some friends, bring some beer, whatever you want. But if for no other reason than to pour one out for all the amazing anime like it, that could have been. And of course, thank you guys so much for watching. I would like to thank our lucky patron of the week, Mala, and our high tier patron of the week, Henrik, for all their support. And of course, all of our patrons. My name is Mike. This is Bonsai Pop. Hope you enjoyed the video. And I'll see you next time. Bye.